All persons having business before the Honorable Chief Judge and Associate Judges, now presiding of the District of Columbia Court of Appeals, draw near and give your attention. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. This Honorable Court's now in session. Please come to order. Great. Uh, good morning and welcome to the District of Columbia Court of Appeals uh, for our uh, virtual oral arguments, which are being live streamed on um, YouTube for public participation. Um, we have three cases set this morning for argument, and I'm joined this morning by uh, Judge Stephen Glickman and Judge Corinne Beckwith. Are the parties ready to proceed in the first case, which is uh, Sven Arn Andreasen versus Sylvia Agoli? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. You can proceed, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the court. Uh, Your Honor, I, I would like to reserve three minutes for uh, rebuttal. Uh, my name is Edward Kang, and uh, I represent the appellant, Sven Andreasen, in this case. When Ms. Agoli uh, first initiated this action uh, in the lower court in the domestic relations branch back in January of 2020, she captioned this case as, quote, a letter of transmittal to register and enforce a foreign support order. Consistent with that caption, the opening paragraph of her initial filing, she identified two statutes upon which she requested uh, the recognition of the foreign support orders. Number one, the Uniform Interstate Family Support Act, known as UIFSA, and number two, under the Hague Convention, which is codified in DC code at title 46-357.06. Both of those statutes are those that govern recognition of foreign support orders. However, the lower court did not expressly hold that it had jurisdiction under either UIFSA or under the Hague Convention. Rather, it found that it had jurisdiction under the Uniform Enforcement of Foreign Judgment Act the, what's known as UFCHA, as well as under the general principles of comedy. Right. Go ahead, Your Honor. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, Counselor, I just wanted to jump in. Um, the, the trial court enumerated a couple of different uh, statutory and other principles, including comedy, um, under which um, the judgment could be registered and ultimately enforced. Um, aren't we free on appeal to, to consider all of those um, and perhaps even um, adopt a, one different from the ones that she ultimately decided these, this case on? It is true, Your Honor, that this court can consider alternative grounds that's, that may support the same result uh, that are supported by the record. But I will say number one, as an initial matter, as to the concept of equity, which Judge McLean noted, the parties never raised, brief, or argued that issue. And so therefore there is no record uh, of, of that basis for jurisdiction. And, and thus I would submit uh, that issue cannot be, in, uh, this court cannot infer, uh, affirm on the basis of equity. I would also submit your honor that with respect to you, uh, UIFSA and the Hague Convention, while certainly there is a record of those arguments having been made before the lower court, that is not affirming the same result based on alternate reasoning. In our view, that's affirming a different result altogether, finding, a, uh, finding that there's subject matter jurisdiction on a completely different basis where different processes of registration and enforcement apply. And so thus, I, I would submit, Your Honor, that uh, the cases uh, that the appellee cites 
are not applicable here. Uh, irrespective of that, Your Honor, even if the court were to consider UFSA and the Hague Convention as a basis, uh, our position is that this court uh, should hold that they are not foreign support. The Belgian order in this case is not a foreign support order that can be recognized under those statutes. And in particular, the Belgian order makes clear that the order that it was issuing was not one of spousal support. It made clear that it's an order that's merely enforcing a contract between two individuals. Can I, can I interrupt you with this sort of a definitional question? Are you, if you assume, and I understand that you don't, that this is a foreign support order, do you see it as a convention support order? Um, I, my understanding, Judge Beckwith, is that um, Belgium is uh, within the, uh, is a member of the Hague Convention. So yes, I believe that if this was a foreign support order, it could potentially be recognized under the Hague. Okay. But again, our argument here is this was, the underlying order was not a domestic partnership order. It was not a spousal support order, it was a contract that was being enforced. And, and there's, a, there's a, just a matter of labeling or no. See, I have no. trouble understanding why that label makes a sure. difference. In practical sure. effect, it meets the definition, it seems to me, of a foreign support or of a support order in our statutes. Sure, Judge Glickman. And uh, I'll note that it mattered both in Belgium and it, th that distinction matters here. It's not just semantics. The reason that it mattered in Belgium was because if ultimately this underlying cohabitation agreement entered into by Sven and Mizzavoli was a spousal or a domestic partnership order, then under Belgian law, and we brief this in the court below, there would actually be a time limitation of how much Mizzavoli would be allowed to get the benefits that were identified in the cohabitation agreement. In general, under Belgian law, uh, under Belgian divorce law, the obligation to pay spousal support generally cannot last longer than the duration of the marriage or cohabitation. And so there would be a time limit as to how much Ms. Agoli would be entitled to the benefits. Ms. Agoli- Do you, do you have support for that, for that yes. um, statement? That is that in your brief that that's part of Belgian law? Yes, it was actually briefed, Judge uh, Beckwith, um, and presented, um, and it's in the record, at AP 113. This was part, this was a part of a supplemental brief that we had submitted to the lower court uh, for additional reasons as to why the lower court should deny registration. Uh, and it was on page three of that brief, which we submitted uh, on July 17th of 2020. But it's in the record and the appendix says AP 113. The Belgian, specific Belgian law uh, that uh, articulates that concept of time limitation is uh, CCIV Article 301, Section 4 under Belgian law. And there's a site in our brief and at the appendix uh, to that specific law uh, as a hyperlink. Is there any significance to the fact that this was in family court in Belgium? Well, she brought it, uh, uh, my understanding is in, she brought it in family court, um, uh, but ultimately the court held that this was not a family law issue and again was was a contract. Um, and so, Judge so, so Ms. Mr. King, does this point that you're making about the Belgian law and the, um, uh, what you're describing as the time limits it would have imposed on this support agreement, does this go to your argument that under the U UFJA um, statute, this order would not be entitled to full faith and credit? No, or Your Honor. UFJA statute is not relevant or that comedy would not be um, applicable here. I guess I'm just trying to categorize which argument this would go to. Totally fair. There's, it's, it's hard to keep it in mind. And let me be clear about it. There are uh, this argument about the Belgian order not being a support order and, and rather a contract goes to the arguments as to why 
this is not recognizable under UIFSA or the Hague Convention because both of those provisions, this is Title 46-356 and 357, both of those only apply to family support, foreign support orders. And our argument is this is not a foreign support order. This is an order that enforced a contract. And therefore those two grounds for jurisdiction are gone. You why would, okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. You're getting to the second part of my question. Of course. The reason that UEFJA, the Uniform Enforcement of Foreign Judgment Act, which was one of the, one of the bases that Judge McLean found jurisdiction, the reason that that statute cannot supply jurisdiction is actually quite clear and was made clear in, the, in this court's opinion in Ahmad. And in Ahmad, this court held that UEFJA only applies to recognition of judgments from other states, not from, up, not from foreign countries. Okay. And the o- the and only the way you- comedy. comedy is not necessarily tied to either of the statutory right. provisions, is it? Sure, sure. Comedy, our argument as to that, Judge Rigsby, is that comedy um, is not an independent basis to, to su- supply jurisdiction for the lower courts. And, the, and Ahmad, in our view, made this very clear. Ahmad at uh, page 1001. And Ahmad there said that comedy in the legal sense is not a matter of absolute obligation. It's simply the recognition allowing one nation uh, within its territory to recognize legislative, executive, or judicial acts of another. But it goes on importantly to say that in the absence of a federal statute or treaty, recognition of an, an enforcement of foreign country judgments is a matter of state law. And so our view on that is Ahmad was clear that in order to recognize, in order for a DC court to recognize a foreign a country judgment, there either needs to be one, a federal statute that says so, number two, a treaty that says so, or three, a state law that says so. But can you really get that from Ahmad? I mean, Ahmad, it, it's, it, it, it to me highlights the difference between the UIFSA, I don't know if that's how you usually pr- pronounce it or if you shorten it, um, and the UFCMJ, in terms of whether it provides the only basis for um, recognition of a certain kind of order, you know, the UFCMJ, CMJA seems to say that comedy can be a basis if the order doesn't fall within the scope of that act. Um, but in Ahmad, it did, you know, whereas mm-hmm. UIFSA seems to say that other bases can support um, recognition or enforcement, even if that particular statute does not apply. Um, isn't that your problem with Ahmad? No, and I actually think um, there, there's a, a couple of things why Ahmad, in our view, um, very clearly stands for the proposition we're, we're, we're citing it for. Um, and again, we're citing it for Ahmad stating that comedy in the absence of a specific statute or, or law that says comedy can be a basis for jurisdiction. Unless there's that, you can't just sort of use this general discretionary jurisdiction. And I'll, I'll tell you one of the reasons why it's clear in addition to that language I cited. The New York court judgment that that was that uh, Standard Chartered Bank was seeking to now recognize in that case in DC. New York actually recognized, because New York has a specific law, or I don't know if it's a, a statute or, 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 or a court case, they actually had a law that allowed for recognition of foreign judgments under principles of comedy. And yet the DC Court of Appeals held that that was not enough, that that was not enough because there wasn't a specific statute in DC where th- there would be proper recognition of the New York court order. And so I think that alone highlights, in addition to the language uh, that, I, that I stated below, that the DC Court of Appeals was rejected comedy in the absence of a specific statute or law as a basis to ground jurisdiction for recognition of a foreign judgment. But it didn't involve the statute that we're looking at. True. So, 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 Mr. Um, so, um, uh, that that is 
Well, it is actually, it is, it, it did address one of the statutes that we're looking at, which is the UFJA, the Uniform Enforcement of Foreign Judgments Act. And they clearly held that UFJA is, is not. Um, so um, that, that's, that, that, that UFJA is own, cannot be applied to recognition of, of judgments from foreign countries. The, the reason as to why uh, Ahmad also is, uh, it, it is important on this issue of comedy, I know that um, uh, uh, opposing counsel has argued for this savings clause provision, uh, 351.04, claiming that while well, Ahmad could not have possibly considered UFSA, because UFSA and the, the savings clause reference to UFSA uh, was it was uh, enacted in 2016, two years after Ahmad? Okay. Well, there's one problem. Was there's a couple of problems with that. First of all, nothing in UIFSA actually said or overruled Ahmad, and so as a, as a result, it actually you know it it, it confirms that there's still the, this notion that comedy cannot be a basis for for uh, an independent basis for jurisdiction. Also, the reason why. Uh, opposing counsel's argument, in our view, fails, is because the UFCMJRA, which was considered in Ahmad, has a savings clause provision, has that same language about, about comedy, and yet Ahmad still, despite the existence of that provision in the UFCMJRA, still held that comedy was not an independent basis for jurisdiction. So, the fact that the UFSA was later enacted with a savings clause provision, in our view, uh, simply cannot be read to, in, in a way to say that Ahmad does not apply. All right, I just, I guess I'm, I'm confused by that because the, the UF, <laughs> what is it, the CM, the yep. <laughs> CMJRA. Yep does not have the same kind of language that the um, U, <laughs> UIFSAG. Um, yeah. You know, it really, yes, it, comedy can apply, but um, the, the, <laughs> the basis of, you know, it, it, it didn't matter there because, because um, Ahmad, uh, the order there did fall within the scope of the act. So, you know, that just seems like a different situation. I, I don't think that Ahmad, and maybe, maybe I, I should take it a little bit higher level, uh, Your Honor. These are, these are very good questions. I don't think Ahmad can be fairly read to be limiting just to the interpretation of the two statutes that were being considered. I think Ahmad, fairly read, was talking about generally when comedy can be used um, as a way to supply jurisdiction. And in that case, certainly the uh, UC, UFC MJRA and UEFJA were at issue, but there wasn't anything in there in our, in our view that was limiting the principles that comedy can only, be, can only be the basis for jurisdiction when there is a state law that says so. I don't think it was limiting, the, the DC Court of Appeals was limiting that holding simply to those two statutes that were being considered. So I do think you can graft that holding equally to consideration of the UIFSA, UIFSA and the Hague Convention uh, that we're dealing with um, in this case. And again, to be clear, we don't even believe that UIFSA and the Hague Convention properly applies because we don't have a foreign support order from Belgium we simply yeah. haven't heard that enforced. Okay, if, if I may, and if the chief will allow me, because I know we've gone, gone through your time, I'd like to get back to that yep. with you, to that position that you've taken, that under the Uniform Foreign Support Act, <laughs> may I make it that right? Yeah. Under the Uniform Foreign Support Act and under the Hague Convention, um, what we have before us is not a uh, foreign support order. Um, I'm not sure I understand your reasoning on that score. You've made the point that the Belgian family court treated it as a contract and that under Belgian law, um, a contract of this nature would be time limited. Um, now, 
if there's a time limitation, I suppose that goes to it, to the question of enforcement and that, you know, the extent to which and how this document, this, this agreement is enforced or this order is enforced is not really quite before us, I don't think. But it, it seems to me that I, I still don't understand why, regardless of what label is attached to it, um, this is not as a matter of law a support order within the meaning of our two statutes. To the extent that it doesn't involve people who were spouses, that is to say, people who were married under the laws of the foreign jurisdiction, that doesn't seem to matter given our, um, our legislation declaring that we take a broader view of um, the kinds of relationships that that are encompassed by this. So it's not clear to me. And so my question has two parts, I think. One is explain a little more fully, if you would, why you think this is not a support order for purposes of those two statutes. And um, whether you think, regardless of whether the trial judge in this case um, relied, rested on those two statutes, whether you think there was any fact in dispute pertinent to them as opposed to simply questions of law. Sure. I'll take those in turn, Judge Glickman. Um, let me let me say, let me talk a little bit about uh, sort of further illuminate why this was not a, a foreign support order um, in, in Belgium. Um, again, as as mentioned, um, there was there were actually there was a dispute in Belgium as to whether this is a support order or whether this is a contract. Mr. Andreasen argued this, if to the extent that this is a support order, then it's restricted to the same type of limitations that support orders, whether it's a domestic partnership, spousal or otherwise, in it, it is restricted to the same limitations uh, uh, under Belgian law about the time limitation. Nizagoli said, no, she argued the contrary and said, no, this is a contract. This is not a, a spousal or domestic partnership uh, issue. This is merely a contract between two individuals. And she argued that and ultimately prevailed and ultimately reaped the benefit of it because again, the order now required, because this was no longer subject to any time limitations, Mr. Andreasen is now required under the Belgian order to pay Ms. Agoli these, these amounts in perpetuity, unless uh, un, until one of them dies. Now- May, may I ask you a question about that? Sure. When, when, she, when you say she argued it's just a contract, it's not, doesn't meet the requirements of Belgian law for a spousal or domestic partnership relationship. It, it, it remains the case, does it not, that it is a contract for the support of Ms. Um, Agoli by Mr. Andreasen? Uh, after the dissolution of their um, relationship. Is that, is that not a fair characterization of it? It, it is in, in the sense that this is a contract that is sort of enveloped within that issue. But I don't think that that's what the Belgian order can be fairly read to sort of put that imprimatur, that it is a support order. Because again, here, um, I'm reading from eight, the Joint Appendix AP021 um, at the bottom of that page. Um, it, here, the Belgian court held, quote, agreements between non-cohabiting partners, as was the case when the party signed the contract, are exclusively governed by the general rules of the contract, notably by the conditions for validity of Articles 1, 1108 uh, CIVC. In that context, it is incorrect to claim that as the first court did, that it would be unacceptable that the provisions governing a cohabitation agreement between partners would exceed the benefits married people who decide to divorce can lay claim to. So again, I, you know, our interpretation, Judge Glickman, on this is they were rejecting the proposition that this needs to be viewed from the lens of a divorce or a domestic partnership or a spousal agreement. Rather, it is a contractual relationship between two individuals. Certainly a contractual relationship that comes up in the context of uh, sort of two individuals that were living together, but still for purposes of their analysis, 
they, uh, they, in our view, made very clear that they were looking at it as a contractual relationship. And the second side of that coin then, Your Honor, which is, well, why does that matter? Well, why does that matter here in D.C.? And the reason it matters is because there are two different distinct statutory grounds. If this is a foreign money judgment order that the Belgian court decided uh, as to resolve a contractual dispute, that is not an issue that can be properly brought under the UIFSA or under the Hague Convention. It must be brought under the UFCMJRA. It's a mouthful. But the UFCMJRA has different procedures, different mechanisms, and they actually have more stringent requirements to uh, before a, a petitioner can get uh, the lower court here to recognize a foreign money judgment order as opposed to a foreign support order. And so that's why the distinction here matters in our view is because we would have been able to avail ourselves of a number of additional defenses at the recognition stage that we wouldn't, that were unavailable to us under the UF, UIFSA or the Hague Convention. For example, I'll give you um, one example. Um, under the UFCMJRA, we would have been able, and this is DC code 15-364, which lays out the standards for recognition. Sorry, I didn't catch that again. What's the section you just said? 15-364. Thank you. Yep. So here, the standards for getting it even recognized, right? Um, the, the DC code states, a court of the District of Columbia need not recognize a foreign country judgment if, and then it lays out eight, eight bases for which a foreign country judgment does not need to be recognized, but two of them are particularly relevant to, to our arguments here. Number one, um, subsection C2 states that it doesn't need to recognize a foreign country money judgment if the judgment was obtained by fraud that deprived the losing party of an adequate opportunity to present its case. And number two, judgment or the cause of action on which the judgment is based is repugnant to the public policy of the District of Columbia or of the United States. So those are two, I, I will state that those are two issues that Mr. we are King, taking. Yes, I, I, I didn't mean to cut you short on the answer, but I have to say, you know, when I step back, I, I understand um, the very well-reasoned legal arguments about these various statutes that you're raising and, and um, your interpretation of this as a contract, but, I, I find it hard to do that when we just look at what happened here. You know, the parties lived together, cohabitated together for over 20 years and agreed that if they broke up, that they would support each other, offer each other support. So, uh, I, I mean, to the, the, the characterization that you're arguing that you'd like to give to that arrangement in hindsight is a little troubling where, where it seems clear from the circumstances and the fa underlying facts and the fact that the people involved were in a long-term, nearly 20-year relationship where they agreed mutually to do, to, to do this. Uh, that, that just sounds in um, support um, and in uh, uh, family support here. And it, it seems like unwinding that agreement in hindsight um, it runs counter to what seemed to be at the heart and in, in the interest of both parties for 20 years uh, during, during this cohabitation relationship. And it wasn't just a business cohabitation, it was a relationship. Um, at the heart of it, that is it, um, seemingly more akin to a family support relationship, now, notwithstanding right. all of the provisions of the various statutes. And so um, I'm having trouble with this part of your uh, analysis. And um, I'm wondering, uh, 
I guess to, to follow up on Judge Glickman's, one of his par parts of his question about whether the issue of whether this is a support order or a contract is an issue of fact or a legal determination. Uh, if, which, which is it in your view? Um, I think this, this might be an issue of, of fact, I guess, is the, the, you know, the, if the lower court needs to opine on whether, on how, because I guess the Belgian order and what it means, at least as part of the record, um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of coming up with this off the cuff a little bit here, Judge Rigsby, we'd be happy to look into this more if that's an important issue. But sort of my off the cuff reaction is the Belgian order was submitted as essentially as a factual record for the lower court to consider. And so I would, I would think that that's probably then an issue of fact that, that maybe needed to be decided on remand by the lower court. Um, Can I take you back I, to, to where, where you were talking about the need, I mean, the need for the procedural requirements. Mm -hmm. um, why isn't the failure to provide those harmless? And didn't you say something in your reply brief about how the, the trial judge kind of agreed with you and, you know, what you were saying on this, on this aspect of your, of your argument and um, agreed that you should have time to challenge the enforcement. Um, does that take care of your concern? No, it doesn't. Um, because again, the recognition, it's a, it, the, 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 the statutory framework here, Judge Beckwith, is a, is a two-step process. There's, there's registration. And then at least under the UFSA, which you know, our view is it shouldn't even be in that bucket. But even under UFSA, which we were kind of forced into, um, there is then a separate mechanism for consideration of whether the order should be enforced. And so this appeal right now is solely dealing with uh, the lower court's decision on the issue of registration. Now, one of the things that we've argued um, is that the, the lower court's order, which should have been confined just to recognition, skipped a, a number of steps and sort of said, we recognize it and we enforce it. And it, now it's enforceable and we can attach Mr. Andreas's property. And, and we, our argument is, whoa, that's, you know, we can take re recognition, but we get, we have a process, there's a process in place by which we get notice, by which we have 20 days to request a hearing. Um, and the, the, the lower court and I have used, skipped all of those steps um, and deprived us of that opportunity, even if we're in the UFSA box to have uh, a, a hearing as to whether the order can even be enforced. And so th those are, those are um, that's still, that is one of our arguments as well in terms of the procedural error that this opinion uh, makes. But I think, you know, we've been talking here a lot about sort of the more broader issue of just, was there subject matter jurisdiction on the basis that the lower court found to begin with? And Judge, Judge Ridsby, I do want to go back to your point because I, I do recognize the concern that you have. Um, and, and I think my response to that would be, number one, I, I do think if that's an issue that, that, that needs to be resolved, um, likely an issue on remand to more fully consider that. I would also say that if you take the reason why there is an issue, at least we think that it's, it should be resolved in our favor, but at least it's an issue that should be examined further, is the Belgian order um, makes clear in no fewer than 28 times, they constantly reference that this is a contract. This is, this is the, the nature of the relationship between the two parties was a contractual. And so that's what the order says. And so that's simply, you know, what we were, we believe that that's clear. And also I think that the equities of it, which is Ms. Agoli reaps the benefits of arguing and ultimately the Belgian court holding that this was a contract by getting it over in Belgium, by getting uh, benefits and this stream of payments for an, for an unlimited time period in perpetuity. And then here in DC, by then characterizing it the other way and characterizing as a foreign support order, she got the benefit of a recognition process that's a lot more streamlined than the recognition process would have been 
under the UFCMJRA, had, had, had she properly characterized this as a foreign money judgment and a foreign uh, judgment enforcing a contract. So she's trying to have, in our view, trying to have her cake and, and eat it too. And, and we think that's, uh, she can't have it both ways. Um, thank you, Mr. King. Um, um, Mr. Edwards, we'll hear from you now. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is Hayes Edwards, and I represent the appellee, the appellee and petitioner below, Sylvia Ogoli. It's important to remember the context of this case from which the appeal arises. The parties litigated this matter for years in Belgium. All appeals were exhausted. And at the end of that litigation, the Belgian courts confirmed Mr. Andreasen's <laughs> obligation to make support payments to Mr. Goli. Now he made those payments for a time, but then he decided to take matters into his own hands and he simply stopped paying. By that point, he had moved to DC and now through this appeal, he seeks to establish DC as a refuge for people seeking to escape their support obligation. All my client is trying to do in this case is enforce the rights that were duly awarded to her by a member nation of the Hague Convention. And she's doing that in the jurisdiction that Sven has forced her to litigate it. Mr. Andreasen is not actually seeking to protect or vindicate any right that he has. His goal is simply to make Ms. Agoli's task as burdensome as possible in seeking justice. Mr. Andreasen's arguments on appeal all fail and the lower court's order should be affirmed on both registration and enforcement because both of those issues we're part of a final order and are subject to appeal. Well, can I, can I interrupt you there? I mean, you seem to agree that there is some problem with the trial court's order in um, laying out the bases for the authority to address this issue. But do you think that, that comedy can be a basis for enforcement, whether or not this falls within the UIFSA? Yes, Your Honor, I do. And that was going to be my, my first point, actually, that comedy does provide an independent basis for jurisdiction and registration. Just like a free floating doesn't have to be tied Correct. to a statute. Okay. Correct. And that's regardless of any statute. And this, this concept was first embodied in a judicial order um, that is controlling in the Hilton v. Guillaume case by the U.S. Supreme Court, 1895. And the citation is 159 U.S. 113. And not only did that case say what comedy is and say that it applies, but it gave the test for figuring out whether a foreign judgment should be recognized under comedy. And all these statutes have done are incorporate those tests. Um, the, the what about Court, Ahmad, 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 Ahmad is, is, Mr. Andreessen has come up with a creative argument that I just don't think has any foundation in the actual case. That case says that comedy exists. It's a basis to honor foreign judgment. And then it says DC has two statutes that specifically reference the type of judgment in question in that case. It doesn't say anything about whether comedy exists independently. And actually one of the statutes referenced by that court has a savings clause. So at the time that opinion was written, that savings clause existed and it recognized that comedy exists independent of a statute. In fact, the DC Council Judiciary Committee's report when they passed that act, which is the Foreign Country Money Judgment Recovery Act, specifically stated that foreign support orders are probably more properly enforced through comedy and not through any specific statute. So there's just no foundation for this argument that without a statute, you cannot enforce a foreign judgment because Hilton provides that you can and Hilton provides the test for doing so. The DC Circuit wrote in um, 2013, in the case of De Seppel v. Republic of Hungary, 714 F3rd 591, in determining whether to grant comedy to a foreign judgment, we look to the Supreme Court's decision in Hilton v. EO. Can you walk us through, Mr. Hay, uh, Mr. Edwards, how, how under the tests that you are referencing from Hilton and other cases, comedy fits and would be applicable here independently? Independent of either of the statutes. How does that, the okay. application of that test look here? And, and walk us through it, please. Right, thank you. And, and having read the statutes, I'm sure your honors will find um, common themes expressed in this language. So I'm going to read first from Hilton v. Guillaume at Pinsight 202. And, and this is where the court provides the test. They say, 
Where there has been an opportunity for a full and fair trial abroad for a court of competent jurisdiction, conducting the trial upon regular proceedings, after due citation or voluntary appearance of the defendant, and under a system of jurisprudence likely to secure an impartial administration of justice between the citizens of its own country and those of other countries, and there is nothing to show either prejudice in the court or in the system of laws under which it was sitting, or fraud in procuring the judgment, or any other special reason why the comedy of this nation should not, not allow it full effect. More recently, the DC Circuit in 1981 in the Tahan case, 662 F. 2nd, 862, wrote that the requirements for enforcement of a foreign judgment expressed in Hilton are that there be due citation, and that the original claim did not violate American public policy, and in the language of the restatement of conflicts of law, that it not be, quote, repugnant to fundamental notions of what is decent and just in the state where enforcement is thought. Now, there have been uniform acts passed to um, specifically record, register, and enforce foreign judgment, but they all include these savings clauses. The UIPSA savings clause, which is the one Judge McLean specifically cited to as providing or recognizing the jurisdiction exists under comedy, says, quote, remedies provided by this chapter are cumulative and do not affect the availability of remedies under other law or the recognition of a foreign support order on the basis of comedy. Next subsection. This chapter does not provide the exclusive method of establishing or enforcing a support order under the law of the district. And I'm may reading- I ask you though, May I ask you though, when the statute by its terms does apply to the case before it, wouldn't we be bound to adhere to that statute and if, to, and if the requirements of that statute are not met, um, but, but the statute clearly applies to the case before it, would we just be free to say, well, it doesn't matter if they don't meet the statute because we can, we can invoke general principles of comedy? I would have thought that the opposite would be true, that where a statute is um, enacted to implement uh, recognition of foreign judgments, uh, or certain types of foreign judgments uh, in our courts, then we, uh, when those foreign judgments come before us, we'd have to comply with the statute. And if the statute's requirements weren't met, we wouldn't be able to say, well, but there's always the free floating notion of comedy that we can invoke. Because I would have thought that, well, the whole point of the statute is to rein us in in that regard. Well, that, that's that a good question, on? Your Honor. I'm sorry, did I cut you off? No, that's all right. I was just asking. I was just following up. Ending okay. I'm saying is that wrong? <laughs> that, that's a very good question. Um, so I think UIPSA does apply here because this is a foreign support order. But to your point, when a foreign order fits specifically under the language and the definitions of a statute regarding enforcement, I think we should follow that procedure. But the savings clauses make very clear that these uniform acts were not created to exclude anything from the jurisdiction of the court. And the test for whether the foreign order should be accepted that are laid out in these, in these uniform acts is exactly the same test as the, the Supreme Court laid out in Hilton. So if, if it fits the definition, then you give it the test in the statute. But if it doesn't, then you can also give it the test under comedy. The outcome will be the same. And, and it's very interesting below that both parties have always referred to UIPSA as providing the rights, obligations, and procedures for this case. Sven continues to this day to seek relief under UIFSA in the way the Superior Court continues to handle the case. The record was more than adequate for the, the court below to have found that UIFSA applies. So although comedy does provide the, the safety net under everything, the TARP, and it really has the same test, there is, there is jurisdiction in UIFSA and, and this court can't affirm on that basis. But what if, you know, what if you, um, if, if just say you, you could not, you knew you could not meet the definition of support order. Um, and I understand you think you can, and you may be right. Um, but, you know, it, it, Judge Glickman's point is interesting. It's like, wouldn't, why isn't it skirting the purpose of the statute? Or are these statutes really just out there because, oh, here's a way this happens a lot. Let's smooth this procedure over with these statutory provisions, but there might be other ways too, and we're not saying anything about those as opposed to um, 
you know, you can't circumvent uh, what we're trying to accomplish here? Good question. And, and certainly you can't circumvent anything because it's always the same test. We're not trying to change the test when we apply comedy. Um, if you look at the DC Council's legislative intent, as stated in the Judiciary Committee's report, they thought at that point that the foreign support orders are so different in every country that maybe they're not the best fit for Uniform Act, and maybe they should all be taken up on a case-by-case -case basis. But the uh, Uniform Act was then passed, so I understand maybe they, they decided differently, maybe the Hague Convention was such a big force they couldn't resist it. Um, but it, it really doesn't matter because the same test applies no matter what. And really what these statutes do, if you read them through as confusing as they are, and trust me, I know they are confusing. And that's not just the alphabet soup, the procedures are confusing. All they're doing is testing for the type of comedy standards that was laid out in Hilton v. Guillo. They're not providing some um, full litigation or, or full procedure that is much different. I think one of your honors pointed out that um, any error below, which we don't think there was, would be harmless because Fed has had more than enough opportunity to challenge the support order for enforceability. And I think that's a really important point here. This court should order or should affirm the enforceability findings below and should stop any further proceedings about enforceability because Sen was served with a summons that told him he had 21 days to respond to the request for enforcement and registration. He did. He filed three briefs, and he cited in those briefs as the basis DC Code 46-357.08. Then he lost on every single argument. The court decided to register and enforce. For 28 days, the Rule 59 period passed. He did not move to alter or amend. Then, acknowledging that was a final judgment, he appealed it. So now the question of enforcement is on appeal. And when you look at what happened and you look at what he's saying he's entitled to in the statute, he got exactly that. He got notice that registration had been requested. He got more than 20 days to put forward his argument. And you know what arguments he wants to make now against enforcement? He wants to show that he can satisfy 46-357.08, which he already had every chance to do. And his argument below factually was specifically referenced and rejected by the support or the DC order back at the point of enforcement. So, so that should be affirmed. And that's a very important point here. Uh, Mr. Wanna, uh, I, sorry? I, you may be about to turn to this question, but I, I'd like uh, to hear more about why you um, conclude that uh, this was in fact a support order. Uh, okay, thank you. Of, of you. If, if, within the meaning of UIFSA. Correct. So UIFSA uses the term spouse in the definition of a support order. And the DC Council has been very clear that it intends to provide the protections of married people to domestic partners. And when you look at the definition of spouse, it means people who are married. So if domestic partners are to be treated as married people and given the protections of married people, then they should be treated as spouses. It, it's, a, it's a very simple link between that legislative intent and the language of the statute. Uh, we can start with the People's Drug Stores case um, from this court, 470 A. 2nd 751. It tells us that, quote, even when the words of a statute have a superficial clarity, an in-depth consideration of alternative constructions that could be ascribed to statutory language may reveal ambiguities that the court must resolve. So it's perfectly okay to look at the statute and say, well, I know what spouse means, and then to look at the alternative constructions and see how they play out. And I submit, contrary to Sven's argument in his brief, that if this was construed to only mean people who are literally married, that that would confuse the taxpayer. That that would create a, a big problem in DC law where we have one, one place where domestic partners and legal cohabitants are not treated as spouses. It would be the so only are you saying, I'm sorry, just to quickly interrupt, but are you saying if we accepted your argument, we would basically say, uh, interpret the term spouse broadly, we would say it is interpreted to include this as opposed to going the comedy route and saying, you know, yeah, it says spouse, but we're going to allow enforcement in, in this context, which doesn't include spouse. 
Correct. I, I, I'm arguing that they should be Former. considered spouses yeah. because the definition of spouse is married people and the intent is to treat domestic partners as married people. And, and I'm sure Mr. Andreasen argues that they were not domestic partners and I have two points on that issue. The first is the case of Sarevich v. Stoichkov from this case. And in that case, the court specifically said that because these people had a legal cohabitation that was honored and recognized by the government of Serbia, which I'll note is extremely similar to what the parties here had, that comedy demands that the D.C. Court of Appeals and the D.C. Legislature and the D.C. Code provide them the same protections as married people. And that's, that's directly applicable here. The next reason why is that, and, and it's interesting, in Sarevich, I think there might have been some confusion in the briefing. In Sarevich, the court did not rely on the finding that they were domestic partners. It relied on legal cohabitation, which is the type of arrangement we have here, it's the type of agreement we have, and that's what bridges the gap between contract and, and, and family law. But do, do you, you have, I'm sorry, just every- I'm sorry, I see my time is up. Sorry, so your, your view would be that um, uh, contrary to Mr. King's view, that this determination of whether this was a support order um, uh, or a mere contract is one of law and how we should interpret the statute as opposed to a factual determination. Right, it, it's a matter of law and the, the Belgian court actually said that non-marital cohabitation should not be treated as a third rate marriage but is another form of effective cohabitation. And that's exactly what the DC uh, council has said. The DC council instructed the mayor and the mayor did so in 29 DC MR 8001 to list out the types of legal cohabitations in different countries that should qualify as domestic partnerships in DC and enjoy the protections of marriage. And one of those is Belgian legal cohabitation, which is exactly what we have here that's why they should be treated as married people. Married people are defined to be spouses and they do fit within the language of the US. So I, I see my time is up. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, just before you um, sit down, I wanted to ask you one question about the reliance upon sort of comedy again. If we, if we went, if we agree that there, it was okay to rely on kind of this free floating comedy, does it matter that that's not really the basis, that's not the basis at all um, that your client um, relied upon in, in, um, as a ground in the first place? No, because I think you can affirm for any basis that's supported by the record and the law and, and both support that comedy provides jurisdiction here. But, but the alternative would be to find that UIFSA provides jurisdiction, um, specifically as we planned and as I've argued is the case. So that, may I, again, if, if the chief will permit me, may I just ask you to pursue something that Mr. Kang brought up, uh, and that is the um, Belgian court uh, determined that this was a matter of contract, not a matter of a support agreement. Um, what, what significance should we attach to that? Well, it is a contract for support, and it's a contract of legal cohabitation, which the Belgian court says is entitled to its own type of enforcement, and it's not bound by the same limits on marriage, but that it should not be qualified as a third-rate marriage. And there's an interesting line in the Sarevich case where the court acknowledges that one of the parties acknowledges the irony of saying, well, we specifically agreed that we were not going to be married, that we were going to be legal cohabitants, but we should be treated as married people. And the court says, this court says, that's okay because comedy requires and the D DC law requires that we treat legal cohabitation abroad, not as if they were married, but that they get the same protections as married people in DC. And, and well, that's where how- Where do you understand the Belgian court was hung up on this distinction? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the beginning of your question. Yeah. What, what do you understand to be the reason that the Belgian court was hung up on this distinction? Well, Mr. Mr. Andreasen was arguing that this should not be in the family court and that his obligation to provide support should be um, limited in time as it would be if they had been married. But the court basically said, look, this is a contract. This is a private agreement. This is not um, cookie cutter marriage. You agreed to it. You agreed to 
provide support, and we enforce legal cohabitation as creating support obligations, just like DC does. So that that rationale, I think I see now. In other words, that what what I think you're saying is that that rationale doesn't mean this wasn't a support agreement. The, the what, what the Belgian court, in your view, was simply saying is that look. If this were simply following the default, the default rules that the law provides for marriages, there might be certain restrictions that we would impose. But you entered into a, I could say, quote, support agreement to, um, and, and, and you were in a different relationship from marriage, but one which is still, you know, uh, recognizable and you're bound by what you agreed to. You can modify some limitations, in other words, that the law would otherwise impose if you just did a traditional marriage. If that's if I have that, if that, do you think that what I've just said, somewhat awkwardly put, because, uh, but, but but do you think what I've just said is um, a fair characterization of what the Belgian court did? It is uh, correct. I'll ask Mr. Kang the same question on. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. It's a special type of contract. It's not not a contract for the sale of widgets. It's a contract between registered legal cohabitants to provide each other support. See, that suggests to me that this is still a support agreement, even if for other purposes, the Belgian court was at pains to say, uh, was, it, was at pains to emphasize the contractual nature of the arrangement. Well, right, but I think they also- And a support um, order, I, not just a support agreement, but a support order. Correct. Um, Okay, thank you. And I do think the court should should read the language after the language of Mr. Kang quoted earlier from AP 21. I think it sort of shows that the, the Belgian court actually went the other way and said, this is a legal cohabitation agreement. It is not bound by the, the, the boundaries on marital support, but it can still be enforced the way a marital support order can be. So I, I thank you for your time today and the opportunity to, or, to argue before this court. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Edwards. Uh, Mr. Kang, uh, you've reserved a few minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. And, and certainly, uh, Your Honor, if you have questions, please uh, fire away. There, there are just a couple of things. I know I spoke quite at length earlier. There are a couple of things I want to touch on in direct response to uh, Mr. Edwards. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about Hilton, and I want to talk about the savings clause. And this is, again, we're going back to the issue of uh, comedy. Um, the, the way we read Hilton is, is a little bit different than, than Mr. Edwards. I think Hilton, first of all, is a federal case. Uh, and I, I, my, my general thrust and, and takeaway from Hilton is Hilton, which is a case from the 18, 1890s, is basically saying um, comedy can be a basis if, 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 if courts so choose or if the states so choose. But it doesn't say that comedy must be a basis for, for all states and all jurisdictions. And I think that's why um, ultimately um, Hilton does not answer the question that's at issue, which is, does DC law uh, recognize comedy as an independent basis for jurisdiction? And we think that the Ahmad case in that respect is, is much more on point. Certainly Ahmad had the benefit of the Hilton case um, and uh, even cited the Hilton case and, and certainly understood what Hilton stood for. And the, the, the court in Ahmad, if they, wanted to say that comedy is an independent basis for jurisdiction, then it certainly could have done so. Uh, but it declined to do so. And I think as a result, uh, reflects uh, in our view and why we interpret it this way, that still in DC, there is no state law in the district that allows expressly for comedy to be a basis for jurisdiction to recognize uh, foreign judgments and orders. Um, the savings clause, sort of a similar argument that we have here. If you take a look closely at the savings clause, this is 46-351.04, the header is called remedies cumulative, okay? And it states remedies provided by this chapter are cumulative and do not affect the availability of remedies under other law or the recognition of a foreign support order on the basis of comedy. Our interpretation of what that means is simply the DC legislature saying, um, the remedies that are provided here can't limit the party from seeking other remedies based on the same issues. 
and, uh, and that's sort of under under other areas of law in in DC, or a foreign or recognition of a foreign support order on the basis of comedy. What I interpret there is they could also go and seek remedies, for example, in another state where a foreign support order could be recognized, uh, uh, could recognize comedy as an independent uh, basis of jurisdiction. You could enforce it there and obtain remedies there. So in other words, this is a savings clause. It, It is meant not to take away any remedies available, but it's not in our view meant to add any bases or grounds or new grounds for jurisdiction on comedy. That's simply not how we we read it. And um, to the extent that it's a savings clause, that's what savings clauses do. They ensure that rights can't be taken away. They don't actually add new rights uh, in, into law. And so that's, that's, I think, a fundamental point of disagreement um, uh, that I have with opposing counsel. And I think, honestly, that's how you can harmonize and square both uh, this, this section of UFSA, the savings clause, with Ahmad. I don't think that they, they are in contradiction. They can, they're can they totally in sync and in harmony um, with each other. Um, the reference to the Judicial Council, which I know um, opposing counsel also mentioned um, in their brief, while I recognize that there was uh, a footnote in passing by the Judicial Council to sort of, again, uh, give, um, uh, uh, give a little uh, reference to comedy, uh, that is not law. That's not a state law. And again, Ahmad makes clear that in order for there to be jurisdiction under comedy, it has to be either there has to be a federal statute, a treaty, or a state law. A judicial conference note um, is not law. Um, Sarovich, just to really uh, briefly address that. Um, again, our main argument has been that um, this goes to the issue of whether it's a foreign support order for purposes of UFSA. And Hague, again, our primary argument here is, as I've stated, this is not a foreign support order. Sarovich, um, our, our, uh, our distinction on that is the language in the, the statute that was actually being considered in Sarovich, which is 16-910, um, actually references domestic partnerships. And as opposed to um, uh, UIFSA or the Hague Convention, in our case, domestic partnerships um, is, is, is not uh, actually said. It only says child, spouse, or former spouse. So to, to, to your point, Judge Beckwith, um, to read it uh, that way would require this court to take one step further, certainly than the court uh, did in Sarovich, and to uh, define spouse in a different way, as opposed to Sarovich, which simply stayed true to the specific uh, DC code and language in that particular uh, statute. Um, the King, are you, you about to wrap up? I know we've taken. No, that's it, Your Honor. I've talked more than enough gentle. today. Unless, <laughs> unless Your Honors have any other questions, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to to speak in front of you. Great. Uh, I would like to thank both counsel for your briefs and your arguments today, and you're free to exit our virtual courtroom at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Good day to the court. Thank you. All right, uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Temple. And um, I see Mr. Uh, Bacon is, is is logging on as well. Good morning, Mr. Bacon. Good morning, Your Honors. <clears throat> um, good morning, Your Honors. All right, uh, this is our, our second case for argument this morning um, in the matter of uh, Anacostia Road LLC et al versus Eastern Heights LLC. Um, uh, or counsel, are you ready to proceed? We are, Your Honor. Uh, may I proceed uh, by saying that we reserve six minutes for rebuttal, please? 
Okay, but just uh, state your name for the record again. Yeah. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Donald Temple, and I represent the appellants, uh, uh, Anacostia here, LLC, 1323 Anacostia Road, LLC, et al. And uh, we are here respecting the court, re requesting the court to reverse and remand the lower court's decision, which found that a partnership status did not exist between the parties particularly during the period December 2016 through May 2017 and thereafter. The standard of review is actually correctly cited by the appellee, clear error. And the primary issue here is essentially uh, and, uh, whether the lower court applied in, incorrectly the partnership standard and its analysis of the partnership dispute between the parties regarding the development of a real estate opportunity uh, uh, at the uh, Eastern Avenue uh, address. But isn't that inconsistent with um, what you just said our standard of review is? Does it all boil down? You know, are these questions of fact we're looking at and and it all boils down to whether they're clear, clearly erroneous or are you saying the judge actually applied a, uh, an inaccurate, a wrong and inapplicable uh, legal standard, which sounds like a legal question? Actually, they're both, Your Honor. Thank you. Yes, and and to um, this case is a, is a unique case in, in in certain respects because we have at issue here uh, a real estate opportunity and development, which where the, in this particular record was clearly approached following the sale by the appellants to the appellees of two properties in the District of Columbia which incentivized the appellee to enter into a partnership relationship with the appellants. In this particular case, that relationship, and I would ask the court master to spend with the facts in the interest of time. Um, well, let me ask a question um, just to make sure I'm understanding your argument on behalf of Anacostia LLC as to when this partnership was allegedly created. We understand, as you referenced, that there were two other sales that really are unrelated to the sale of this particular project uh, property. When did this, there are no written partnership documents, at least not in the record. Well, and uh, was when, in your view, did the partnership agreement um, come into being because uh, you know according to the trial court it didn't and um, where it likely could have come into agreement with the uh, documents I think from April of, of 2017 or 2018 where um, Eastern Avenue LLC laid out specific steps for Anacostia to take to um, um, finalize the partnership agreement those didn't happen so I just wanted to try to clarify from your perspective when the partnership was formed. Well, well the uh, partnership is not a typical agreement like a contract agreement. We're actually talking about a partnership status that was formed over a continuum of time beginning in December, 2016 through May, 2017. And the governing, and this is the problem that we have with this case, is that the court approached it as if it was an agreement that was entered into. In the absence of a partnership agreement as here, an express partnership agreement, there are laws that apply under the DC statute and particularly under uh, Beckman versus Farmer and Queen v. Schultz. And our, 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 uh, our law states that in the absence of an agreement, two or more persons intending to associate together to carry on as owners for profit uh, along with the notion of a profit sharing agreement, joint control of decision making and capital contributions constitutes a partnership. In this particular situation, Your Honor, to your point, the partnership status, we would argue, was consummated during the period of time, December 2016, and it was effectuated uh, certainly by virtue of the agreements, uh, uh, the expressed intent of the party to form partnerships, and the actions uh, that I can explain to the court along with the elements of this, um, uh, the, the statutory elements uh, and case law and common law elements of the partnership. So as of May 2nd, uh, 20, 
17, that partnership status was effectuated. We would note that uh, there is an agreement dated uh, uh, May 2nd, 2016, and there's an agreement dated thereafter on April 17th, 20. Uh, there is a writing, excuse me, on May 17, April 17th, 2017. Those writings, however, uh, contrary to how the court view those writings, the writing on May 2nd is fundamentally distinct from the writing on April the 17th. There is no contractual agreement entered into on April the 17th regarding the partnership. There is a writing, and that writing uh, uh, achieves a state of ambiguity because this notion of a partnership and the, the, uh, the essential uh, consummation of the status of the partnership between the two LLCs would have been achieved subject to the, uh, an, an operating agreement. That operating agreement, however, does not, the effectuation of an operating agreement doesn't obviate the fact that the partnership was developed consistent with the statute and consistent with case law by uh, trailing the totality of the circumstances and the relationship between the parties to pursue the development opportunity. Let me be clear, for example, one of those elements, this, this opportunity uh, to develop Eastern Avenue was uh, initiated by the appellees. The appellees had uh, owned the property through another LLC, which is 1416 Third Street LLC. And the appellees, after having sold two properties, lucrative opportunities to the appellees, offered to them the opportunity to participate in the development of a third deal. And in, in offering them the opportunity, however, they clearly spelled out, and it's in this record abundantly, that they did not want to merely sell them the property. They wanted to do a deal and retain an ownership interest. In pursuing that opportunity, uh, and to the court's original question, between December and starting in December, the uh, appellant, uh, which uh, consisted of two individuals who were keenly uh, uh, sensitive to what this opportunity meant, which was the Eastern Avenue property would sell for 770 and subject to development would then be able to uh, resell for or be valued at 2 million to 2.4 million. So there was a unique opportunity there. They brought that opportunity to the appellants, appell appellees. And so they clearly agreed that they would associate for purposes of making a profit on this particular opportunity. In addition to that, there are other uh, elements that have to be considered in ascertaining the extent to which there's a they, partnership. They agreed, would it be fair to say that they agreed to associate uh, in a partnership on certain conditions, such as the part, such as the would-be partners making certain contributions, which partners typically do make when they when they form partnerships, and the would and in this case, that never came to fruition. And the trial judge, therefore, seems to have had ample basis in the record to find, as he did, that the parties contemplated making a partnership, wanted to do it if they could get together and actually do it, but that your clients were never able to meet the conditions, and so no partnership was ever formed. How can you say that the, the ample findings by the trial judge that I've just very briefly summarized were clearly erroneous? Well, number one, Your Honor, uh, because the courts, what the court is stating in terms of the applicable law uh, uh, is not exactly that the, in terms of achieving a partnership status here, it, one is that there has to be capital contributions. And the, no, the court recognized that there didn't have to be all those specific things, mm -hmm. but the court is making factual findings as to whether these parties, in fact, ever made it, ever uh, reached the point where they had a partnership. They talked about it, they talked about doing it, but the judge found it very clear that the um, plaintiffs in this case, were not gonna go into a partnership with people unless those people made certain contributions to the joint effort. And those people said they would do it and then they didn't do it. Well, well so I think that- I'm having trouble understanding why the judge's determination was clearly erroneous. And, and I appreciate that, thank you, Your Honor. The, the, but there's a, there's a, there, that is in part the analysis. However, it is not the precise analysis. Under our case law, the, the, the question is whether the 
And we're talking about not necessarily the agreement to say, well, you have to pay 100% of this amount. We're talking about the achievement of a partnership status, the achievement- You're talking about people a, intending to associate together. Yes. But, now, these people uh, intended but, to get to the point where they would associate together if certain preconditions were met. But that's different from saying that they were, that they already were associating together in a partnership from the get-go, from as early as December. Well, well, I'm not. Well, I'm certainly not. Certainly, the trial with, judge could find, could he not? Well, no, uh, that's not what the record states. However, Your Honor, and I understand the court's point, but that is not what the record states. That it was, in fact, a capital contribution, and not merely one capital contribution. The record shows, in this particular situation, that the uh, appellants contribute. Tid and, and made a deposit of $21,000. And out of that $21,000, uh, there was $10,000 returned to uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ali. However, $11,000 was deposited into the joint account of Eastern Heights. And was, that, there some, was there some uh, evidence that that money was uh, related to other debts that um, your clients had to? Um, uh, the plaintiffs? Well, well, Your Honor, first of all, to be clear, the money was not, <clears throat> there were other relationships, as I've indicated earlier in other transactions. This particular transaction is between Anacostia and Eastern Heights. Anacostia paid $11,000 for this record into, and it was deposited into an Eastern Heights account. That so it's actually a partial performance. It's, it's a partial performance, but in terms of the receipt of it and the expenditure of those funds on the Eastern Heights project, which was testimony that came into the record below, that money, in addition to the fact that not only that money, but other capital contributions preceded that in terms, uh, and our case law says that time, energy, resources, knowledge, et cetera, can constitute cap capital contributions. In this particular case, the opportunity uh, was developed significantly by the appellants. I would direct the court's attention in that regard to the text message uh, where the parties are talking about the, uh, the pro formas, the appraisals, but not only that, <clears throat> what's critical there in a nuanced way is, is that this, this project was being developed with the knowledge of the appellants to the extent that there would be uh, section eight developments, et cetera, et cetera, and an appraisal not to deal with the actual sale of the property, which happened in January, but an appraisal which would value the property based upon the input of the appellants and their knowledge about the development of the project to two, $2 million. And there's a text message uh, in this record. And in fact, um, at JA1201, where there is an appraisal that comes back at 2.2, and the parties are talking in the context of we. The only point to that, Your Honor, in terms of the capital contribution is that the appellants testify that they financed some of those um, uh, pro formas and, uh, and drawings, including the business plan. And they were involved in the, in terms of their time, resources, and energy, strategically and jointly in the development of the project. So there is, in fact, a capital contribution. It, it does not, as the court is correct, it does not amount to the exact capital contribution, but that is not the issue though. In this particular situation, if a partnership status is achieved and we suggest to the court that it is achieved and there is a dispute, we know there's a clear dispute that arises and the analysis that has to be given is not a contract analysis in terms of the termination of the partnership relationship, but then a partnership relationship then uh, and partnership status then dictates otherwise. And that if there is a dispute between the parties it has to be resolved more consistent with partnership law than with contract law. And that's not exactly what happened here. Mr. Temple, um, you referenced that uh, essentially, and I'm gonna paraphrase, I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you're saying that because uh, these two entities worked together in the past to successfully sell and develop two other properties, um, and, and decided to do the same with respect to the property here, that, that, that that's the reason that we can presume or assume that, that you all had a partnership. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if, with it, was there a written partnership agreement with respect to the sale of the prior two properties that you referenced? 
Okay, let, let me be clear for the court because I, I, I want to try to clarify that fact that the two prior sales, Your Honor, uh, had nothing to do with this partnership. And they were basically arm's length transactions between Anacostia and the appellees. And those were very lucrative deals where the appellees made more than a quarter million dollars on each of those properties. They were sold below market. There was no partnership agreement with respect to the sale of those early two properties. No, they, right? they, were, they were straight up contracts and they happened in around October right. 2016. So period. what's different here? Because uh, you started out by set, teeing this up that you all had this prior successful collaboration on the sale of these other properties and decided to do the same. And then I sort of hear you saying, and, and therefore this time we had a partnership implied, even though we didn't have any written partnership documents. Sure, it's important to understand to, you, to, the, to the courts, a uh, very significant question in terms of distinction in those relationships is that in December, when a third opportunity arose the appellants stated to the appellees, we don't want to do an arm's length transaction as we did before. We would like to retain an ownership interest. And in this record, there are ample, and we pointed out in our briefs, there are ample discussions where, and even the court in its opinion states that it's very clear that the parties intended to do a partnership. The intent on the partnership, and, and it's a nuance, Your Honor, if I may, and, and, but but and it frankly, wasn't clear to the to the trial court, and I guess we're trying to figure out what was the legal error on the part of the trial court in failing to clearly discern that there was a partnership here. Actually, Your Honor, um, it was clear to the trial court, and the trial court's decision is strained in this regard. At JA ten eighty six, the trial the trial court says. He says, it's clear to me that the defendants uh, contributed to these efforts, not just to make the sale, the January sale go through, but in the long term, they intended to partner with the Sharmas and the Sharmas intended to partner with them. And the point, he's, he, he knows that they significantly cite the, the fact message in that, that I referenced to the court, that the properties of praise value pre-sale, uh, I mean, uh, subject to the development would be estimated at $2 million. That would mean that each of the partners in the situation would make a half a million dollars. So in the, uh, the, the notion of the analysis and why the judge erred is because in ascertaining the extent to which there's a partnership versus a contract, and in this case, it's a nuance because a partnership is not an agreement. It doesn't consummate necessarily an agreement. It consummates in a status. And I, the, the most simplest way to explain that is, is that a husband and wife have a marital status. If there is a dis difference between they can't just walk away from each other, they have to get a divorce. If a partnership is established, and we suggest and urge to the court that the intent was consistent, and not only was the content intent consistent, that there were steps that were taken throughout the process, including the agreement after this, after the sale, the parties entered into the March 2nd agreement. The March 2nd agreement is distinct from the April agreement. The March 2nd agreement, it, 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 it memorializes. So we, there is no agreement, but that is in effect an agreement, the only agreement, quite frankly, in this record and where the partnership is, is memorialized. Once that partnership status is achieved as here and there is a dispute, then unlike a breach of contract, where the parties can go either way, once that partnership is achieved, that status is achieved, then the parties and the court has to approach it in a different way in terms of a resolution of the, of the problem. And that's what we submit to the court occurred here. As to the April document, Your Honor, and I think it's important to the court to note that the April document was viewed essentially as a contractual document by the court, and the court found uh, against the uh, appellants uh, that they did not comply with that document. And, and, and one of the problems that we had in that regard was that, and if the court would indulge me, I just want to take a sip of water, was that that document uh, had a provision in it regarding an agreement that the parties uh, were to enter into. It did not spell out uh, anything further than the parties were to enter into agreement, the nature of the agreement, any of, any of the particulars. And the issue there for the court, which is prejudicial, substantially prejudicial in terms of the record and the finding of facts is the court found that the uh, appellants uh, 
were supposed to have prepared that agreement. And in so doing, and what led it to do that was an issue here, uh, as this court might know, I mean, we came into this case as counsel a few months beforehand and there were evidentiary issues. We couldn't get documents and files, but in this particular case, the court, uh, the appellant referenced an email that she claimed that uh, one of the uh, uh, appellate, uh, that, that Mr. Carter had sent to her and we objected to that email uh, because we said it was hearsay and we, it wasn't produced. And the court said, well, um, even though it wasn't produced, I'm gonna let it in. And my next question was, what was the date of this email that corroborates that the appellants were supposed to submit this agreement? And the court said, I'm not letting that, uh, uh, that you're going too far. So we were handicapped. There was no evidence that for, for, for purpose of the record, that was an error allowing that hearsay evidence, which was uncorroborated and unauthenticated to come in to basically validate the court's view that it was the appellant's responsibility uh, to uh, prepare that particular agreement when there is no other evidence, Your Honor, in this record that supports that. All righty. Um, unless my colleagues have any additional questions, um, I know you reserved a, a few minutes. We'll give you a couple minutes for your rebuttal argument. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Bacon? Yes, may it please the court. Um, James Bacon, I represent the Appalachee Eastern Heights LLC. I'll refer to them as Eastern Heights. Um, as Judge uh, Glickman properly points out, this case involves um, the appellants making um, an, uh, an agreement or understanding with the Appalachee that had specific conditions that were never met. And therefore the trial court correctly ruled there never was a partnership between Eastern Heights and the appellants. Um, in addition, the trial court correctly ruled that the deed conveying half of the property at issue and that property was 622 Eastern Avenue to the appellants was improper. And the court also correctly ruled that that property had to be deeded back to Eastern Heights. <clears throat> now the court found there were two stages uh, to this transaction. The first stage was that the uh, Eastern Heights would purchase the property by itself exclusively. Then the second stage was the parties could enter into a partnership if one was feasible given the party's finances. Now, to that end, the court considered many things. For starters, the appellants were going to lose this property if the uh, Eastern Heights had not purchased it. In fact, um, they had acquired the subject property from a hard money lender and they, in their arguments, failed to mention the evidence that the loan was going to mature and they were going to lose the property and lose their investment. So their position that they contributed this property uh, as a part of a partnership um, was, according to the evidence, not the case. Mr. Bacon, um, can I just ask a, a factual question? How do you characterize the the acts of, you know, evicting doesn't seem quite the right word, but the acts of evicting the, the, ten, the tenants, um, you know, what, what was that in service of? It seems, it seems like sort okay. of a charitable act or it seems kind of like a lot just to maintain the sale. Here, here's why, um, and here's how I characterize it. I characterize it the same way the trial court did hearing all the evidence and facts. When you have a motivated seller, who is motivated to uh, sell this property, especially when they have the risk of losing it and everything they put into it. Not only will you prepare pro formas to explain what a great deal this is, you will agree to evict anybody who's in there for purposes of allowing the closing to go forward and the title uh, reports and information to be prepared consistent with what's required in order for a closing to occur. And that's precisely what the evidence was in this case. All of these factors that are established as facts and testimony of 
uh, providing documents about how great this property was, being willing to evict um, uh, people who are in there that shouldn't be in there, was all evidence of a motivated seller to make sure this transaction occurred and that Eastern Heights solely purchased this transaction because otherwise your investment's gone and you lose the property and you lose the possibility of subsequently partnering with Eastern Heights. And I'd like to get to that if I can, because council, I think inadvertently mentioned a May 2 agreement and an April agreement. I think he meant March 2, because this was a closing that was supposed to occur on March the 2nd. And um, what happened was the parties executed a, an agreement and the court found that the March 2 agreement that was executed prior to the actual closing with handwriting set forth the requirements. And the, the court found that um, while the uh, appellants did do some things, those things to benefit the sale of the property are consistent with and were uh, motivated by their desire to sell this property and not have it uh, not close, because if that happened, they would lose the property. And that was the evidence. Uh, in addition, there was evidence that one of the appellants had a, a, a number of judgments against him, um, so they couldn't get financing and were in a very difficult uh, spot. So... <clears throat> Uh, on March 2, an agreement was signed that indicated that Eastern Heights would uh, contemplate selling 50% of its ownership when it purchased this. And there were two versions of this. And these uh, versions, again, one was handwritten, the other was not. The court found the handwritten one uh, to be the one that controlled and indicated the intent of the parties. And that provided that the monthly mortgage payments would be split, the expenses would be split, and the down payment would be split, but none of that occurred. Um, in addition, the court found that the fact that you signed, that they had signed this agreement to have a partnership undercut and was goes against the argument that there was a partnership prior to closing. The court asked opposing counsel, when did this partnership occur? The position of the appellants has been a moving target. It occurred before closing, but if it didn't, it occurred after closing. And the whole argument was we did some things to make this purchase occur, all of which is what a, a seller would do to make their sale. And then their position is afterwards, uh, we were partners. The problem with the argument of we were partners and had a partnership before the court found was signing an agreement to do that on the day of closing undercuts against the argument that there's some kind of a that a partnership ag agreement existed or some understanding existed prior to closing. In addition, one of the appellants testified um, that when the March 2 agreement was signed, he believed that gave him the right to wrongfully transfer half of this property um, to his company, which again, the court found undercuts against this whole notion that there was a partnership prior to the closing on March 2. The court then considered the April agreement um, which was consistent with the handwritten version of the March 2 agreement. And the April agreement provided the, the appellants were to pay certain sums uh, part of their obligation if they wanted to be involved in a partnership, including their half of the down payment, their half of the mortgage payments, their half of other uh, expenses, none of which happened. We did hear... Uh, uh, council reference this money that is approximately $20,000, the court heard that testimony and the court determined from the uncontroverted evidence that when that payment was made, 
to 21,000, 10,000 of which was immediately paid back to the um, appellants, and the other 11,000 went to pay for another project that they had not been able to finally pay off and fund. That is the appellants had not been able to pay that and had owed that back to uh, the principles of uh, Eastern Heights. So that money did not go to and can't be argued to be a contribution to this partnership. And that's how the court found the evidence from the testimony of all the witnesses. By the way, what was the reason given for the $10,000 um, repayment to appellants? I believe that um, it, was, it was a request, if I recall correctly, um, one of the principals, I think his name is Mr. Wardeer, um, had a, a personal obligation and he was um, given that 10,000 according to the, the, trans, the, uh, the testimony. Does the record indicate what that personal obligation was? I'm not sure it does, and I'm not sure they, um, they, raised, they wanted, they, ex they just said it was a personal obligation as I understand it. I don't think they wanted the court uh, to um, understand the nature of that. And what was under the, under the um, uh, when this was initially, when it was initially decided that they would pay $21,000, what was that $21,000 supposed to be for? That was in connection, the, the initial $21,000 payment was to take care of some obligations. Again, these are, the principles of these companies are, uh, we'll call them house flippers in DC. And they, you know, variously worked together sometimes and uh, assisted others. They, they, these principles of the appellants were in need of funds at this time and were in a difficult spot. Um, no, I understand that. But why were they paying twenty one thousand? Why, why did they putting aside that ten thousand dollars that uh, that came right back to one of them? Why were they paying twenty one thousand dollars to um, uh, Eastern Heights? They were paying that $21,000 because that was owed in connection with the development of another, a separate, distinct, and um, different project in DC that Eastern Heights was working on with them and providing uh, contractor services for um, these principals at another location. Uh, so, I can't so you're remember telling me that that $21,000 payment had nothing to do with the property that's the subject of this case. Absolutely, Your Honor, and the transcript will so reflect and the court so found. So, <clears throat> um, the court considered all the evidence and found that the indicia of co-ownership was never present either before closing, during or after closing, the property was purchased by Eastern Heights without any indication in the sales contract of any type of partnership. The funds used to purchase this property came from Eastern Heights. The written agreements in March and in April reflect an agreement for capital contributions. There was no agreement beforehand. And the appellant's argument that we did some things, and by the way, we contributed this property is not consistent with the evidence that the court found that they were going to lose this property by the hard money lenders who had defaulted them and were going to uh, take it away from them had they not sold this property to Eastern Heights. Um, now, finally, th this the appellants did not reply to this argument, but but even if you assume a partnership which did not exist, the appellant could not legally have conveyed this property. The property was owned by Eastern Heights um, and under DC Code 29, 
0.07, that would be an act outside the ordinary uh, affairs and activities of the company and can only be uh, contemplated or undertaken, if you will, with the consent of all members. And Ms. Sharma was a member at all times and, and the principal of the appellant admitted he didn't tell her. He went there acting as the owner of her company and signed documents under oath transferring her company's property, half of which to his company. And so even in the light most favorable to the appellants, it's still an ultra rarest act uh, to deed over 50% of the property to the appellants. And unless the court has any other questions, um, I don't have anything else I think I need to say. Uh, Chief, you're on uh, mute. Sorry about that. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Bacon. Uh, Mr. Temple will give you a couple yeah. minutes for a Your Honor, may I go to uh, Judge Glickman's question? Uh, the council is misrepresenting the record regarding the $21,000. I would direct the court's attention to page Joint Appendix 1089 uh, of, the, uh, of the appendix. And the court basically stated there was a capital contribution. It does not qualify it. Not only that, when the appellee, appellant tendered that money, he did not tender that money to pay debts. Part of the, in the record, it will show that he actually was concerned because the monies that were paid were paid by Ms. Uh, Anisha Sharma, who was not a party to the agreements. She was acting on behalf of, of the uh, LLC and she paid the money independently. But part of that money in this record went specifically to the construction costs of uh, Eastern Heights. So I want to be clear about that. Additionally, when the court asks about co capital contributions here, it's important to understand that this is in a development opportunity and it's a consummate, it's a continuous consummate process. And so the process, the, the, the property sold, uh, Your Honor, is for $770,000. It's standard in, in the industry uh, that there's a 10, 20% deposit. 20% of 770 is 140. The deposit was initially $25,000 paid here, and it was subsequently reduced per the communication of the parties to $10,000 to accelerate and to facilitate the transaction. In addition to that, what, we, what is critical is, is that Careful also said that the uh, agreements were the same. They were not the same. The April, the April agreement, and he's correct, it was March, it was different. But what's also important is that that $21,000 that you asked about, Judge Glickerman, was paid on uh, 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 April the 1st. And it was before the, a, the latter agreement, and it was paid specifically into the joint account. What's also critical here is that on the loss of the property, it was a distressed property. But the uh, appellants had the opportunity to take that deal to anyone in the marketplace. And so there is nothing in this record, no evidence whatsoever that on a particular date in time, if they didn't do a particular act at a certain time, that they wouldn't lose the pro pro property. There was a concern that if they didn't act with this particular party, that that possibility exists, but then they had the option to go to someone else. All can, in all- Can I ask you, um, Mr. Temple, um, what is your response to the last point that Mr. Bacon made about even if, even if you're right that there was a partnership, this act would have been an ultra virus act. Um, have, I don't know whether you responded to that in your brief. Uh, yeah, no, I, I didn't respond to that. Number one, it wouldn't be an ultra virus act and, and, and that there's obviously a dispute. I mean, we're not running from the fact that there's a dispute here. What we're saying is that in well-established partnership law under the, the Uniform Partnership Act and the applicable case law, the issue of the development of a partnership status is the question. If a partnership status exists, then what we're arguing here, and that is not a question that the lower court should determine by bifurcating a pre-March 2nd analysis and looking at this agreement, of course there wouldn't be any uh, information in the January sales agreement regarding the partnership because that's an independent the arm's length uh, transaction, but it's also part of the development opportunity. And so to the court's question, if there's a partnership dispute, then partnership law applies. You can't walk away and say, I don't love you anymore. You have to then have a, a, 
a partnership dissolution issue, but in an equitable context, you then have to come together and the court should review it and analyze it under the partnership rubric. Unfortunately, the partnership is the close cousin of a contract. But at a certain point, it is, it is so close that uh, the parties often get confused, as did the lower court, about what's a contract and what's a partnership and what it takes. The court did not look at the totality of the circumstances. The uh, court bifurcated and said, well, after the agreement, there's no partnership. And before the agreement, there's no partnership. But if you look at the totality of the circumstances, you look at the opportunity, you look at the fact that the uh, appellants were intimately involved in the planning of the transaction, the appellants lowered the cost, the appellants paid for plans, the appellants paid to have uh, the squatters, not tenants, not leasers, squatters evicted uh, or, or removed from the property. And then the appellants put money down, but because there was no uh, operating agreement, and it was a concern to Judge Glickman's point, there was a concern because if they were spending money that was given by Mr. Ali uh, without his authority for something that was had nothing to do with this transaction, which is at issue and that uh, we, we don't know from this record whether it was legitimate or not, but they sua sponte just took his money and said, we're gonna go over here, even though you deposited over here, then the appellants wanted to have an agreement. If there's a dispute, uh, Judge Beckworth, uh, between the parties at that point, after March the 2nd, then a partnership status uh, factored into consideration requires the judge to then apply a partnership versus a contract analysis. And with that, I'd like to thank the court for its time. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate uh, both counsel your briefs and arguments um, and your to exit our virtual courtroom at this time. Thank you. All right, uh, good morning, uh, council. Uh, this is our third and uh, final case set for argument today. Um, April Goggins versus District of Columbia. Uh, are parties ready to proceed at this point? Yes, uh, and uh, Ms. Um, Braslow, um, uh, you, are you still a student attorney with the Georgetown uh, Law Center of Civil Rights Clinic? Yes, that's correct, Your Honor. And I have the supervising attorney, Addison Francois, uh, with me in the room today. Okay, all right, that was gonna be my question. Uh, oh, we appreciate your argument today. Are you ready to begin? I am, thank you. Good morning, or good afternoon, rather. And may it please the court. My name is Jacqueline Braslow, and I'm here today on behalf of the appellant, April Goggins. I'd like to reserve four minutes for rebuttal. All right. This case is about a DC agency failing to meet its burden under FOIA law to conduct a FOIA response process reasonably calculated to produce all responsive documents. This case presents an opportunity to this court to uphold the spirit of disclosure enshrined in DC FOIA law by resolving any doubt in favor of the requesting member of the public, Ms. Goggins. The Superior Court erred when it granted summary judgment to the district below for three reasons. First, MPD did not show a reasonable FOIA response process beyond a material doubt, as is the agency's burden at summary judgment under the law of this court, as clearly stated in the 2016 FOP case. Second, there was a genuine dispute that MPD failed to liberally construe Ms. Goggins' FOIA request, which is a long held duty of government agencies as stated by instructive case law, such as Nation Magazine and Truett. And third, additionally, there were indications in the record that MPD did not carry out the FOIA response process in good faith, making summary judgment in the agency's favor improper 
per the 2013 FOP case. As to the first reason for the error in the Superior Court, the record before the Superior Court raised substantial doubt as to the reasonableness of the FOIA response process, in particular, the responsiveness determination part of that process. As laid out clearly in the instructive case law, Charles interpreting federal FOIA, which is a parallel to DC FOIA, the responsiveness determination or the agency looking at what records are located as a result of plugging in certain search terms in certain locations is part of the overall FOIA process that an agency undertakes. And if that part is challenged, that responsiveness determination is reviewed by the court for reasonableness. And we see this in cases cited in our briefing, such as Ray, Shapiro, and Leopold. The Superior Court, however, did not take MPD's responsiveness determination process into consideration in its ruling in order to find reasonableness. Ms. Brazel, excuse me, can I um, just ask for a little more clarification on that part of your argument? As I understand it, your, your reasonableness or, or your argument that they did not make reasonable efforts is twofold. Um, part of it is that you feel with respect to the requests for documents about um, surveillance or monitoring of Ms. Goggins, who was an organizer with the Black Lives Matter movement, that they narrowed the search artificially by the way that they defined surveillance and monitoring. Um, now we did have an affidavit in the record from uh, Ms. Parker from MPD who handles the FOIA request explaining um, to some extent why that in their view, it was an appropriate interpretation of monitoring. Essentially they only looked at certain police units that conduct specific surveillance details. What uh, was unreasonable in your view about that uh, methodology? So in this case, um, so for two things I want to explain in response to that question is looking within the four corners of the affidavit submitted by MPD, which on their face uh, need to sufficiently explain the process the agency underwent, which is the burden laid out in, in case law, such as the 2013 FOP case, which did not happen here. And second, the, there is a genuine dispute as to the, the narrow interpretation raised in the record uh, outside of those affidavits, chiefly in the, in the depositions of, uh, of FOIA officer Parker. As to the specific agencies, uh, units within MPD conducting uh, monitoring and surveillance activities, that is a narrow interpretation that does not liberally construe this request uh, as, it, as an agency should under FOIA law. The parties agreed to apply a plain meaning of monitoring and surveillance to this request. There is a genuine dispute, however, as to whether MPD in fact applied that plain meaning of monitoring and surveillance. And one of the indications in the record leading to, to that is this technical view of monitoring and surveillance as only something that specialized units within the MPD can do and not something that say a patrol officer can do if they are watching a, a certain civilian or watching Ms. Goggins and we have in, in Ms. Parker's in FOIA Officer Parker's deposition testimony on uh, page 347 of, of the appendix, uh, a statement that a patrol officer watching Ms. Goggins, which is an, an activity a lay person, a reasonable juror perhaps, would consider within the plain meaning of monitoring and surveillance would not be responsive to this request. And this is a narrow construction that does not meet the, the duty that a government agency should undertake when responding to these requests from the public. Now, is there some contrary um, material? I, I know you, uh, appellants argued um, to the trial court that um, monitor and surveillance should uh, uh, use a, a dictionary definition, I believe you said. Um, was there any support um, in any of the 
any case law or any NPD policies uh, that that you brought to the trial court's attention that would show that their definition of monitoring surveillance was counter to their actual policies or practices and therefore unreasonable? There, Officer Parker uh, was not able to point to any MPD policies about the what definitions were used, but in this case, on the facts of the record before the Superior Court, we know the parties agreed to this plain meaning, and this plain meaning upholds the principle of liberally construing a FOIA request. Uh, and additionally, there there is case law supporting the idea that narrowly interpreting a request is contrary to an agency's duty under FOIA. We see that in Charles. Um, and additionally, going back to the, the affidavit submitted by MPD, if I could bring the, the court's attention to the November 2018 affidavit in particular, this was the, the last affidavit, affidavit submitted by the agency in this case. It described an agency-wide email search for Ms. Goggins's name, Twitter handle, and address, and variations of these three things, and located this, this one instance, this search in their email database, turned up 9,000 pages of documents, which were deemed uh, by the agency in a conclusory fashion to uh, have not located any additional responsive records within these 9,000 pages. And this explanation was not sufficiently detailed enough for the requester to evaluate the reasonableness of that process for deciding that these 9,000 pages of documents containing a civilian's name and address were not responsive to monitoring and surveilling of that individual. Well, I have two, two questions, two follow-up questions. I guess one on the legal side, um, our case law talks about uh, the need where an agency is claiming an exemption to a document um, that is being requested through a FOIA request to provide some explanation. But where the agency is just calling and, and trying to determine whether something's responsive or not, I, I'm not aware of any case law that says under those circumstances, they're required to give a more detailed explanation like you're suggesting here. So in this instance, um, again, we're not asking for something like a Vaughn index for exemptions under FOIA. We are, there is a, a gap in DC case law interpreting DC FOIA as to this part of the process of the responsiveness determination. And this is exactly the instance where the DC, uh, the DC courts can look to instructive case law interpreting parallel <laughs> federal FOIA. Uh, and we read Leopold a case cited in our briefing to, to state that if there's a suggestion of an improper responsiveness determination, then the explanation of that, that part of the process takes on heightened importance uh, so that the requester and the court can evaluate it for reasonableness. And in this case, we have suggestions of that improper responsiveness determination uh, from the 9,000 pages uh, of documents, which a reasonable juror could, could view these pages that include the name, Twitter handle and address of an individual uh, that MPD determined none of them were responsive and find that that was, was an unreasonable process. Additionally, we have- Did you explain something, please? Um, why does one draw the inference that when MPD says, well, we did find 9,000 pages of documents with uh, Ms. Goggins' name on them, but they're not responsive to the request. What is the basis for the inference that you are drawing from that, that the MPD search uh, was improper? So the, the, that inference- or, or that any of those documents was in fact responsive? So that inference is one that a reasonable juror could made based on the facts in the record Why? that raise a genuine dispute as to whether the plain meaning of monitoring and surveillance was in fact applied in these decisions about what that, that's what I don't understand. What is the linkage between so, they're saying that we did find documents with Miss many of them with Miss 
Goggins' name on them, what, but, but they're not responsive. What is the basis for the inference that some of those documents are responsive? The basis would be the, the several facts uh, in the record raising a genuine dispute as to whether MPD applied that plain meaning. We have uh, FOIA officer Parker indicating that a patrol officer watching Ms. Goggins would not be responsive. We have officer the Parker- government, The government, I think, has argued that you're taking that statement out of context. Well, that in, one thing for the police to say, look, we're, we're walking our beat, as an example, or we're checking on a, a big activity that could raise traffic and other problems. And um, it happens that Ms. Goggins was there. And so in one sense, you could say the officer saw her, but he wasn't surveilling her or monitoring her. He was watching the beat in general, the activity in general. And that doesn't seem to me to be, a, uh, be an explanation that is uh, um, presumptively sus suspicious or that suggests an improper interpretation of um, their responsibilities under the, under the FOIA. So there are, now I do want to speak to this uh, watching issue, but also there are other instances in the record bringing up this dispute that I would like to get to as, as well in response to this question. Um, first of all, I, Judge, you, you used the word, um, an officer might have, have seen, maybe they saw Mrs. Goggins. And that is, that's not what um, Ms. Parker's de deposition testimony stated. Um, she Ms. was- Goggins, asked, Ms. Goggins' testimony, but that, that <laughs> Ms. Goggins may well have felt that, oh, they're, they're watching me all the time. But that doesn't mean that when the government comes in and says, well, we haven't found any documents uh, that's, that, uh, that um, relate to such surveillance as you've described, that there's something uh, suspicious about their, their response or inadequate about their interpretation of surveillance. Uh, so I mean, they said, you know, it's true that in their initial response. They limited their search to certain components of the police force that engaged in what you could call formal uh, surveillance or monitoring. But that was only the beginning. And maybe they had to be pressed, but they did expand, as I understand it, the search considerably, including searches of individual patrolmen's, patrol persons, uh, notebooks and um, well, uh, you know, emails all over the place. And, and I'm as I as I say, when all is said and done, I've had a little trouble identifying anything that really looks um, as if the the, the police department um, failed to make a reasonable search. It does not have to be perfect. They can't search every single piece of paper that the and, and every computer record uh, that the police department has, but they've certainly engaged in an undertaking. And to say we found 9,000, many of these apparently are what, communications from Ms. Coggins to the police department? Um, there was, some, there was something, something in the record about that, right? I, I'm just wondering what the real basis is for saying that in the end, the police um, uh, may well have... Um, adopted an unduly narrow interpretation of surveillance and monitoring. So there, there are a few points I'd like to hit in response to that um, very thorough question. And the first would be to, to speak to some of the other instances, instances in the record that raise a genuine dispute about this narrow interpretation. And one would be the watching a civilian and, and the question in, FOIA officers Parker's deposition was if there were a record indicating a patrol officer watching Ms. Goggins, uh, would that be responsive? Not watching her neighborhood or, or seeing her walk by, watching Ms. Goggins, would that be responsive? And the response from FOIA officer Parker was no. So that, that is one instance. And uh, well, oh, Let me just follow up on that as, as well as on Judge Glickman's question. Uh, of the materials MPD ultimately produced, um, you know, initially the, the, this, this production was in fits and starts and perhaps a little sluggish initially, but 
ultimately they produced even the unresponsive documents to some of the requests. In, in, in those documents that they deemed unresponsive to your, your client's FOIA request that they did ultimately produce to your client, were there any of those documents that you determined were in fact responsive? So in other words, they said, hey, we've got all these, I think it was about 9,000 documents. Most of them we don't think are responsive, but heck, we're just gonna give them all to you at this juncture, even though we think they're unresponsive. Were any of those documents, can you point to a particular document in those that you deem to actually be responsive? That yes, might give some credence to your thought that some of the other unresponsive documents, which they may not have produced, may have in fact been responsive. There was a lot of, a lot of double entendres there. <laughs> Uh, yes, Judge, there, there is in, in fact a document. Before I get to that, I do want to clarify that the 9,000 pages of documents described as non-responsive, there was no production uh, along with that affidavit. There was a statement that th some documents were that were responsive were previously produced, but there was no description of what those documents were. So that affidavit from the agency that there are 9,000 pages and they're not responsive was not attached to any production. Uh, that that affidavit is also submitted two months after the close of discovery, which did not give Ms. Goggins a chance to question or get, get more clarity about that. And it was submitted about six months after Ms. Goggins' counsel specifically asked for this expanded search. Um, as to the a specific document that, that may point to- well, But there were some documents that MPD deemed to be unresponsive, which they did produce. Correct. That is correct. And, and one of those documents uh, was a, an email that was sent between MPD officers about, uh, an, about monitoring or, quote, keeping an eye on uh, an event that Miss Goggins herself organized. Um, and her name was in this in attachment to this email. And that language of keeping an eye on was in this email. And FOIA Officer Parker sent this to Ms. Goggins. Uh, I believe this is at uh, the supplemental appendix from the district at page 19. Uh, sent that email after her deposition testimony in which she described monitoring events. Uh, and in this letter later described that as, as a minimal presence, but the language of keeping an eye on this event that was not just attended by Ms. Goggins. She didn't just walk by this event as it was happening. She organized this event. Uh, and this, this kind of monitoring or keeping an eye on an event includes watching and monitoring the people who are at that event, especially the organizers of that event. So I think this is one instance that does show us an indication that what MPD determined was non-responsive, if taken a, a more broad construction and applying the plain meaning as a layperson would understand monitoring and surveillance would capture more documents uh, that MPD illiberally declared. Hey, that's declared interesting. The, the FOIA request was for doc. Can you quote the exact language of the FOIA requests? I realize there were six to four, it was like several requests, but the operative language about, I thought it had to do with monitoring or surveillance of the Scoggins. Yes, the, the Wasn't June the request for documents of monitoring or surveillance of particular events that may have been covered by some of those other requests that are not before us now. But um, am I right about that? Uh, yes. So the, I, I must tell you, my initial reaction is to think that a memo talking about you've got to monitor a or, or whatever a watch, I, the word was uh, keep your eyes on or watch uh, an event that Ms. Coggins happens to have um, organized does not strike me as within the scope of a request for monitoring or surveillance of Ms. Coggins. Uh, I mean, what am I missing? <laughs> the, so the, the genuine dispute that we see here is how a lay person, a member of a jury would 
would interpret what a plain meaning of monitoring and surveillance is. And monitoring an event includes monitoring the people at that event, the people who've organized that event. Um, and uh, additionally, it is, it is the agency's burden to liberally construe these FOIA requests to respond to the underlying substance of, of a member of the public's FOIA request. And the M MPD was well aware of the context and the, the substance of this request, which included those uh, itemized uh, numbers 6 through 14, which are modified by the monitoring and surveillance of the Ms. Goggins. The overall substance of the June 2017 FOIA request was a, an activist involved with BLM in DC submitting a FOIA request to MPD. And the underlying substance was triggered by uh, Ms. Goggins seeing officers outside of community events and meetings related to BLM activities. Not to say that we know there are records relating to those particular instances, but those are the kind of activities that, that spurred Ms. Goggins to submit this FOIA request. And MPD's interpretation of monitoring and surveillance is much narrower than this underlying substance. And we see in cases such as uh, instructive cases such as uh, Barron's and, and Nation Magazine that this underlying substance of the request needs to be taken into consideration by the agency as well. Well, so any event, in any event, the district, the police department eventually did produce that document, for example. There, so, there was... No, this gets back to my earlier question of whether there's a real basis here to, to believe that the MPD in the end apply to, to narrow a, a test for determining what documents were responsive to the, the uh, FOIA request. And, so, and the so fact that they did produce some things doesn't seem to be evidence that they apply, they, they in the end apply to narrow a test. And we, as the requester, are only able to glean information about this process based on the affidavit submitted by the agency and the discovery that was conducted in this case. Uh, and there are instances in that record that, that raise substantial doubt as to the reasonableness of that process. And we're focusing on the process as the requester. We don't ultimately know what records the agency has and we're in that disadvantaged position as the requester. But in terms of the, the document about the monitoring and event that MPD did produce, that was one email and FOIA Inspector Parker indicated in her deposition that she didn't know how many of these sorts of emails uh, considering of, concerning events were included in, not in the 9,000 pages, but in an earlier uh, about 3,700 pages that were located as a result of a of an email wide search just for the name April Goggins, and that search was not did not take place until ten months after the request was submitted, despite a specifically itemized uh, number ten in the FOIA request asking for a search of her name. All right, which... Ms. Ms. Barazzo, um I I know you reserved um, some additional time for a rebuttal, um, and I think we touched on uh, your key. Uh, arguments at this point, and we'll also uh, reserve your time for a rebuttal, unless either of my colleagues have any additional questions for you at this time. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, um, Ms. Lapsack? Good morning, may it please the court. Sonia Lapsack for the District of Columbia. An agency's response to a FOIA request need not be perfect, only reasonable. And there is no doubt that the district conducted a search reasonably calculated to find records that were responsive to Ms. Goggins' FOIA request. Indeed, Ms. Goggins agrees that the district used reasonable search terms, searched reasonable locations, and those locations ultimately included a global search throughout the entire MPD for responsive emails and other materials, um, and that the district ex reasonably explained its search processes. She also agrees um, and we heard today that the proper way to identify a responsive record is to apply the plain meaning of the terms monitoring and surveillance and to identify as responsive records that reflect the monitoring and surveillance of Ms. Goggins. The dispute is thus a narrow one. She disputes that the district applied 
the plain meaning of the terms monitoring and surveillance. She claims that the district excluded police patrol activities that involve an officer, a patrol officer sitting outside her house, intently watching her or monitoring her activities. But that assertion finds no support in the record. It is well, reputed, well, by the well, way. Um, I think maybe that might be oversimplifying it just, just a little bit with, because there were some specific dates and times that um, Ms. Goggins provided as part of her FOIA request where officers were sitting outside of her home and where one instance where the watch commander knocked on her door and asked for her identity. Um, and, and so, um, you know, there is some resonance with her point that you know, to a lay person, uh, you know, what is the difference between a police car parked outside of your home and some official more elaborate surveillance that may perhaps be done by the intelligence division of MPD or, or the narcotics division. And I think when you, that's not an unreasonable concern. And I, I'd like to hear how, how in your view, the, the motions, summary judgment motion judge correctly resolved it. But, but I guess sort yes, of- Yes, may, may I take oh, that point? Because I, I think well, I can provide you- yeah, uh, I, I, would, I want you to, but I want you to do it in the overall context here of what seems to be a bit of a grudging at best FOIA response by MPD. I mean, ultimately six, eight, nine, ten 10 months down the road, they were more forthcoming, but initially the responses were terse and grudging. I, my words, not. And so when you, when you put that overlay on it and then this, um, you know, uh, what some might argue kind of contrary to common sense interpretation of what monitor and surveillance means. Um, go ahead and help me understand how this was reasonable as the trial court ultimately concluded. Certainly. I think the differences between the parties initially uh, was that MPD believed that the places most reasonably likely to have documents about monitoring and surveillance were in the units where MPD actually conducts monitoring and surveillance. And so the district's initial search was of those units. And now notably that search didn't include any monitoring or surveillance overlay, but simply asked about Ms. Doggins, Black Lives Matter and BLM. And those units returned no documents related to Ms. Goggins. And so I think, and what you'll see in the deposition as well is, is uh, Inspector Parker defending that initial response saying, yeah, initially we thought that's where the documents were likely to be if they existed. Now, how, since then the parties have moved on. Uh, not only has the MPD conducted a search in the specialized units, and there's no dispute before this court that those units have no records, uh, but moved on throughout the agency, every patrol officer, any staff, anyone with an MPD government email address became part of this search. And it was also part of the responsiveness determinations. And your honor asked a question about that. And I want to point to uh, places in the record uh, specifically where the MPD described and affirmed its responsiveness determinations, what it was doing, the definition of monitoring and surveillance, because I think it goes directly to the concerns you raised. Um, there are three places uh, in the record. First is interrogatories eight and nine. These are the definitions of monitoring and surveillance that the district said it was using. I'll point to deposition uh, appendix page 317. This is where Inspector Parker is confirming the application of those dictionary definitions and that those definitions are consistent with what monitoring and surveillance are in a law enforcement context. And finally, I point the court to deposition pages, or this is the appendix pages, 330 to 331. And this is where Inspector Parker is explaining how patrol officers patrol and conduct routine monitoring, monitoring for traffic, monitoring for crime, which would not be responsive. But 
if patrol officers were monitoring Ms. Goggins, that would be responsive. And I'll just read the Q and A. Uh, Q. If there was unauthorized surveillance or monitoring or harassment of Ms. Goggins and records of that, would that be responsive to Ms. Goggins' FOIA request? Answer, yes. And I can't underscore this sufficient explanation enough. Not only is it a fulsome explanation of how the district made its responsiveness determinations in response to Ms. Goggins' FOIA request, it certainly satisfies the standard the district court applied in Leopold, which is a case my friend mentioned and is also the, the key case they relied on in their briefing. In Leopold, the court found sufficient that the agency had stated that it used a plain reading approach to make its responsiveness calls and had excluded as non-responsive items that contained one or more of the search terms, but did not, quote, clearly relate to the request. And the district has done at least as much here. All right, thank you. What's the story, yeah. by the way, on those 9,000 emails that have Ms. Goggins' name in them, but that are not responsive? Do we know anything more than that? Certainly, it's no surprise that the 9,000 pages exist. This is a global search of many versions of Ms. Goggins' name. Uh, including her Twitter handle and her address. Uh, Ms. Goggins is a prominent member of the community. She communicates directly with MPD and other district officials. She does that routinely on many subjects of interest to her and her community. These emails, every time they are forwarded, every recipient of the email would ping essentially that email, generating many hundreds of pages of potentially the same email chain. And so I think the 9,000 pages uh, reflects the uh, you know, the advocacy of Ms. Goggins speaking directly to MPD and taking her issues uh, to them and to other district officials. Was this characterization or something like that that you've just given us, was that communicated to um, Ms. Goggins when the issue arose? I don't think there's anything in the record there, but I'm not sure it would come as any kind of surprise. For example, the district produced uh, Ms. Goggins' own communications with the MPD about monitoring and surveillance um, as potentially sort of responsive to her request. Um, so Ms. Goggins had communications back and forth with the district, uh, you know, saying, look, I, I think you're monitoring me. I want the badge number of this officer. I want to know who is sitting in the car. Uh, the district produced those emails. They began on Appendix 127. Uh, there were 68 pages simply on the single concern uh, of Ms. Goggins about the monitoring and surveillance of her, uh, but over years of time uh, and the uh, sort of the active uh, nature of Ms. Goggins' advocacy, uh, the 9,000 pages sounds about, sounds about right. Thank you. Um, so once the district satisfies, uh, and, I, and I think the district here has satisfied uh, its burden to explain its responsiveness determinations. Uh, Ms. Goggins must come forward with evidence that the district did not do what it said it would do. Uh, and there's simply no such evidence. And I think the, the two categories of claims that I heard uh, are either sort of misquotations uh, of the record or sheer speculation about what could be inferred and, and neither of those are, are sufficient. Um, I'll speak specifically to Appendix 347. This is the uh, Q&A about watching, uh, if would Ms. watching Ms. Goggins be responsive? And the answer was something like, no, I would need more information. And, and I think that Q&A is simply taken out of context. Um, you know, it does not stand, you know, and first of all, it, it's completely inconsistent with testimony both previous and following. Um, I think what Parker was doing was she was explaining that Officer Wentz had a patrol responsibility to ensure that all the streets in his patrol area are covered or watched. So that when she said watching would require more information, I understand her to be thinking about the question she answered the page before about watching, um, watching the block, watching for crime. 
And she is thinking about that in contrast to the question she had just answered right above that exchange, where she says, if Officer Wentz were watching or surveilling Ms. Coggins' house, that would be responsive. And, and that's, that's exactly right. Um, and in any event, I think a single argumentative question and answer that's plucked out of context and refuted by the rest of the record, including the district's positions, uh, including that it uses a plain meaning and would consider patrol officer behavior responsive um, is insufficient to raise a triable issue. I'll also note that after this exchange, the Superior Court gave Ms. Goggins an opportunity to depose Officer Wentz, which is the subject of this exchange. And that deposition uh, was not taken despite an extension of discovery for that deposition to take place. The rest is essentially sheer speculation, which this court and the DC Circuit and other courts have said are insufficient to uh, rise to a triable issue. Uh, and, and I didn't hear anything that rose above speculation uh, today from my friend. Uh, a miscommunication with an agency, with another agency of the government regarding a search term uh, does not raise a triable issue as to whether the district uh, properly carried out its responsiveness determinations. Uh, you know, when, when agencies correct mistakes, that's a sign of good faith. I'd point the court to Miracle and Interalde. Uh, which are both cited in our brief. The record also reflects that the district cooperated with Ms. Goggins, uh, including for two years after judgment was entered for the district, attempting to uh, bring this case to a satisfactory conclusion. Uh, we weren't successful in that, but I think it speaks to uh, the district's willingness to continue to engage with Ms. Goggins and, and try to come to a solution that she would find satisfactory. All right, um, thank you. Is there any anything further uh, on behalf of the appellee, Ms. Kaga? I mean, Ms. Um, Lipsack? No, uh, Your Honor, we'll stand on our briefs on, with respect to requests four and five. In reply, it makes, it is clear that Ms. Goggins is not disputing any aspect of the district's production with respect to those requests. So there is uh, no challenge to the Superior Court's resolution. So we're happy for the court to simply affirm the Superior Court's judgment with respect to requests four and five. All right, um, thank you. Um, Ms. Braslow, we'll give you a couple minutes for your rebuttal argument. Uh, you're on uh, mute, Ms. Braslow. Thank you. There are several points I want to address uh, that the district is um, in the rebuttal. And the, the first was a, a question about the, the 9,000 emails. And we don't have any information about what might be in those 9,000 emails. Um, the description of the process to determine that those were not responsive was conclusory in that affidavit, which was submitted after the close of discovery. Uh, stated before. And the the speculation from the district that we just heard that they might be because of Ms. Goggins' advocacy or her emailing MPD, that was not in the record. Um, and we cannot base uh, anything off of that speculation we heard today. And additionally, there was a, a production of some emails that Ms. Goggins had sent to uh, MPD, and that did not amount to 9,000 pages of emails. Uh, additionally, in terms of this uh, watching dispute, this question and answer uh, in Ms. Parker's deposition, it is, it's not inconsistent the way that uh, that raises a genuine dispute as to the plain meaning, because in that same deposition, FOIA Inspector Parker also stated that she filters the meaning of monitoring and surveillance through her experience as an MPD officer and that is on page 317, and that is not how a lay person, a member of a jury, would interpret the plain meaning of monitoring and surveillance. Uh, additionally, we have uh, an agreement in the record, uh, a con another conclusory statement by the district that they did imply the plain meaning, but that does not cure the dispute raised by the facts in the record that as to whether that plain meaning was applied as a lay person would understand it. 
And uh, in, in conclusion, if there are no further questions from this panel, because MPD failed to show a reasonable response process beyond a material doubt, and there was a genuine dispute as to whether MPD liberally construed Ms. Foy, Ms. Goggins' FOIA request, we ask the court to reverse the grant of summary judgment below uh, and in the alternative to remand for further fact finding. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, counsel for your arguments today and uh, also thank um, uh, Anderson Francois, the supervising attorney from the Georgetown Law Center Civil Rights Clinic. And uh, as a student advocate, Ms. Bradlow, thank you for your arguments today. And uh, counsel, you're free to uh, exit our, our virtual courtroom at this time. This honorable court is now adjourned. <laughs>